custom when people join Country Bible Church that we give them a membership certificate and welcome them into our family. And we have the uh, privilege of honoring uh, Scott and Paula DeWeese this morning. If y'all come up, I'll give you your uh, diploma or your certificate rather. We have to come all the way around here. I was kind of skinny right in there. There you go. And welcome to Country Bible Church and to our family. And you too, Scott, here's your uh, certificate as well. Y'all want to say anything? Okay, come on. Well, let me give you the microphone here. So they can hear you. Come on up here where they can see you better. There you put them on the spot. Um, I'm not much for public speaking, but I just wanted to thank Pastor Mike for his um, studying and the teaching, the accurate teaching of the Word of God, because that is um, the most important thing. And so I'm very grateful for, for Pastor Mike and this church. So thank you. Mm, thank you. Scott? We've actually been the members behind the scenes for some time without having been here every Sunday. We've been here with you every Sunday for over a year. Uh, we've seen all the different things that's, that's put onto the uh, video. Uh, we do follow what the church is doing, and uh, we live in Sealy. We don't always get a chance to get here every Sunday. However, we, we do feel like we're members of this church already, and uh, we look forward to continuing studying with you. So thanks for having us. Okay, let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, the option of naming privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who and what you are and that you are sovereign in the universe that you created. We thank you for so many opportunities that we have in order to recognize your faithfulness. We pray for the people down in Florida and in the southern states there that uh, the hurricane is pressing upon even at this moment. We pray for their safety, but more importantly than that, we pray for their their volition to act in such a way that they will seek you and find out that you are the one that is in control, not them, not anyone else, and that they will be humbled and that they will seek your face and they will find you. That is our most fervent prayer. We pray that you will help us here today to concentrate, for we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I want to say a few words about the storm, and then we're going to press on in Genesis chapter 5. We're going to go back to our major Bible events, which we've been away from for three weeks. We've been doing other things. But <clears throat> I was on a conference call, actually it's a video conference, uh, this past Friday, and just about every Friday I'm on this video conference with about, oh, it ranges anywhere from 15 to 20 ice pastors all over the country. And the first thing we do is uh, have a prayer list, and then uh, Dr. Robbie Dean is the one that is, um, I guess you would say, hosts this uh, conference, this video conference. And he asked two people to pray, and that this past Friday he asked me, and he asked another pastor. The other pastor prayed first, and the, this, was, this is how he opened his prayer. And I think it would be surprising to somebody. He, his opening statement was, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these hurricanes. 
that would be a shock to a lot of people. To most people, they would be outraged that someone would be thankful for hurricanes, especially disastrous ones of the type that are uh, plaguing our country as of late. The human viewpoint would think that would be a monstrous statement. Who would ever be thankful for the disaster and all of the uh, carnage that goes along with these horrible hurricanes? That's the human viewpoint. Spiritual viewpoint, divine viewpoint, is much different. Because it is only right to thank God for these hurricanes because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18 God commands us to give in everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I believe everything includes includes hurricanes. And from a spiritual standpoint there is so much good that comes out of these disasters. Not only hurricanes, it could be an earthquake. It's, we've got uh, fires going all over uh, the place. And people would think, well, what possibly could be good out of, out of this? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind as what is being good is God is reminding mankind. He's giving them a wake-up call demonstrating his sovereignty and his omnipotence. Now, omni means unlimited, and uh, potence means strength or power. He has unlimited power. And I don't believe he has to really make that clear to so many people today, today and as of late because he's demonstrated his power. I think we live in a very so-called sophisticated society. We live in a time when we think we've got it all covered. Uh, we have a routine that we expect to go on and on like it normally does. We're pretty well safe. We have plenty to eat. Uh, we really don't need that much religion because we've got just about everything we've, we need. That's the mindset for most people. And they're not giving God honor. They're not giving glory. In fact, they don't really think about him much until a hurricane comes a-knocking, and it's knocking today. So that's one of the good things that we have is God is giving people a wake-up call, a dose of reality to show that he is sovereign in their lives, and there's nothing that they can do to change that. We're, we're kind of in a state that we find in Romans chapter 1, verse 20 through 22. Verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, his God's, that is God's, invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. In other words, that's just simply saying you'd have to be a fool, you'd have to have not a whole deck of cards to recognize that someone greater than man made the oceans and the mountains and the stars and the sun and so forth. So his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. They're without excuse, ignoring God or even claiming to be an atheist. They're, they have to overcome what they already no, from God's own creation, he's demonstrated it to them. Verse 21, for even though they knew God. See, this is saying that every person knows there is a God from the creation. They did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened Professing to be wise, they became fools. Does that not describe the USA today? Oh, we are so wise. We have computers. But we have smartphones. There's devices that I don't even I can't even pronounce, much less know how to use them or 
uh, the young people may, but most of us older, gray-haired folk, uh, some of us have flip phones, some of us have a smartphone, I know I do, which I have a tendency to want to curse from time to time. Isaiah 45, verse 6 through 7. That they may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all of these things. I don't think you're going to have many people that would dispute that, especially in Florida. Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. See now that I, I am he, and there is no other besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal. For the hard, hardened unbelievers, when the, when the wind gets up around 100 miles an hour, when that storm surge comes in, the water starts rising, that hardened heart is in a, in, can very easily become vulnerable, become softened. Who can save you in the fury and a raging of a hurricane other than God? You can't call out to your neighbor. You can't call out, call out to the Coast Guard. You can't call out to the first responders. It's you, the hurricane, and God. And I think there might be a lot of God seekers out there at this very moment. Maybe they're seeking God for the first time. Maybe not so much as to save their soul, but to save their hide. And that's a prelude for God to show that he is faithful. And for them to look to him for the gift of eternal life and salvation. So God has leveled the playing field in a, in a hurricane... Everybody is equally helpless. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't even matter if you're in one of those big high-rise condos. There's a lot of people in those high-rise condos right now, I imagine, that are praying. And when the water goes up in the first floor, you're pretty well stranded. That's your prison. So that's a good thing because people strut about, I have money, well, I have intelligence. Well, I have physical strength. Well, I have beauty. None of that makes any difference at all. I said this before, and I'm pardon the pun, we're all in the same boat. Neighbors are shown to help neighbors. Probably in a lot of neighborhoods, it was this way in Houston, and it'd probably be this way in Florida. People didn't even know their neighbors until this came along, and now they're finding out that they're worth knowing. There are a lot of people out there that are being self-sacrificing. And that's another thing, the courage. Even in fallen man, in the worst of time, there are those who will risk their lives to save you and to go beyond what is considered uh, normal or what is kind or thoughtful, even to... Uh, putting their own lives on the line. People are seeking God. And those who trust God will find this. Psalm 46.1 God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I doubt that many people know that verse. But I bet a lot of them wish they did. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good 
for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, there's a lot of believers out there. I have some close friends. I would call them loved ones in Florida. One is right up. Well, both of them are right close to that Lake Okeechobee, that huge lake. That's the uh, biggest lake, uh, freshwater lake in America outside the Great Lakes. And uh, you've heard me speak of Rowdy. And every time I talk to him, and I talk to him probably at least five times a, a week, he said, be sure to tell CBC, Rowdy says howdy. So I'm saying howdy. He's in a, in a prison, unjustly so, and they, it's crowded already, and they brought 45 more into his wing. He says he can't even get to the phone because they're all laying on, you know, sleeping on the floor and so forth. And his concern was, he says, I just hope that they don't decide at the last minute to uh, evacuate and we get caught in a storm in a bus handcuffed to this chair. Uh, to the seat. Uh, I said, well, uh, but he wasn't, he said that was a concern. He didn't say, he, say he was afraid of it or he was worried because I can assure you that he is in, inspiring those around him whenever the storm hits for his complete trust in the Lord. He will be extolling the Lord and praising him during this whole thing. So he's there and so is his mother and his uh, stepdad uh, they're in West Beach, um, uh, West, uh, yeah, uh, Palm, uh, West Palm Beach, there you go, West Palm Beach in Florida, which is only about a, um, an hour from where he is. Anyway, uh, they are believers, and they know what I just gave you. Because sometimes when disaster happens, our first inclination is, why does this have to happen to me? And we can get bitter and we get angry. And that is divine viewpoint. I mean, excuse me, human viewpoint. It is stinking thinking. And it does you no good. And so we have to be alert. Whatever happens, not just when there are hurricanes happening, but that we apply our doctrine to each situation and that we can be a good ambassador for the most high, because that's what we are called to be. So our prayers are with them, but mainly our prayers that they will seek God and that they will find him because they will be searching with all their heart. Okay, now we're switching gears. We're going to go to lesson 35 in our, actually it's 36, but I'm going to, I'm going to go over Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. We did this three weeks ago, and we didn't get very far through it, and I'm sure if I gave you a quiz of what was on it, most of you would not even remember where we were. Now, I'm not, I'm not faulting you on that because a lot of water has gone on the bridge in the last three weeks. So I'm going to start there again, and I'm glad I went back there because I refined what I had, and I like it a lot better. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. I want you to underline that part in your Bible. In the likeness of God. Some translations say, in the image of God. And whether it says the image of God or likeness of God, those are synonyms. It's still, they mean the same thing. This is the book of genealogy of Adam in the day that God created man. He created him in the likeness of God. Now in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, is the, we have this phrase and this is pertinent here. Genesis 1 27 says that he made, he made them male and female, created he them. That's Genesis 1 27. What stands out at me, jumps out at me in this verse is that it doesn't say that he uh, allowed them to evolve. It says he created them. And there's two different Hebrew words, actually three, that has to do with this, uh, the way they came into being. They were uh, formed 
by the hand of God in, in, in their bodies, Yatsar. And then you have, uh, when he created their, their soul and spirit, that is the word bara, and that means that God created that out of nothing. Only God can do that, by the way. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. So he created them. They did not evolve and there was no gender confusion. There was no gender confusion then and there should be no con gender confusion today. I won't get, I would drill down on this but I've got too much else to say. But this transgender business is an insult to God. It's as if, oh, in my life, God made a mistake. Because I obviously have a male body, but I'm really a female. Now, that's absurd that God makes mistakes. And they are continuing to push this. I saw that there's a show coming on this, I don't know when, in the next week or two, I guess. It's called Transparent. And it's about some guy that's a parent, and he's a... Uh, well, anyway, I don't want to give any advertisement to it. It just shows that uh, this, we haven't seen the last of this, and I hope that you see it for what it is. It is those who think they are wise who have become fools. Rom Romans chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Now, animals produce after their kind, but man is made in the image of God and reproduces his image reproduces in his in his image. This is a, a I have a quote here. I can't find the source yet, but this is what it says. The term terms image and likeness are used synonymously and refer primarily to man's spiritual resemblance that would be his rationality and his morality. These are things that are uh, invisible. You can't see them, but we know what they mean. Animals don't know what they mean. There's a huge chasm between the creation of man and the creation of animals. So the image or likeness refers primarily to man's spiritual resemblance, like rationality, morality, to his maker. God placed a great chasm between man and the beast, for only man has the capacity for eternal life, fellowship, moral discernment, self-consciousness, speech, and worship. Animals don't have any of those type of things because they were not made in the image of God. Even after the fall, man retains his image of God, though it has been marred. So, I'm going to put this on the board I, th I did this this morning because I thought they need to see... I'm, I'm trying to simplify this the best I can. And so we're going to... Let me show this here. Okay, Adam was perfect and Eve was too. Uh, I have under this Genesis 127. So here we have Adam. He was created perfect, made in the image of God. Then we have his sons, his offsprings. And be and you means both believers and unbelievers. All of them are imperfect. They have an old sin nature. And so his sons were made in Adam's image and the image of God. In Adam's image, we, what's important there for us is the OSN there refers to the old sin nature. Adam was created perfect. Every other person is, outside of Eve, is born imperfect because we have his genetic defect in the old sin nature. So Adam's offspring are made in his image, but they also are still made in the image of God. In other words, they still have the ability to think, to have, uh, be moral, 
to have uh, be rational and have mentality and all these things. And in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, it demonstrates that there are those who should be cursed, but they're still made in the image of God, which proves even though he's fallen, he's still made in the image of God in that sense, even though he is imperfect. That's all I'm going to show you for right now. As we press on, I'll add to that. In James chapter 3, verse 8 through 9 says, But no one can tame the tongue. It is, restless. it is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Verse 9. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. Okay? We have unbelievers that are worth cursing, but they were still made in the image of God. They still have what is essentially uh, God has given man a very teensy wincy portion of the attributes that he has. For instance, uh, we have a sense of justice. Now, God is perfect justice, but even among criminals, they have a sense of justice. It's kind of perverted sometimes. I mean, if you rat out some, somebody that's a, a fellow criminal, uh, their sense of justice is, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to take care of him. Uh, that's, that's their sense of justice. What I'm saying, everybody has a sense of justice, but so often it is perverted. We all have a sense of righteousness, what is right and what is not. But sometimes we're confused. Well, what should I do here? What's the right thing to do? God is never confused. He's perfect righteous, righteousness. Uh, God is omniscient, which means he knows everything. Well, we know some things. Uh, we know where the church is. We were able to get here this morning. So we know things, but we don't know everything like God does. And, of course, omnipotent. God is unlimited power. We have a little power. You see what I'm saying? So that is how mankind, all mankind, both believers and unbelievers, have these things that are make us like God. So nearly everyone that is born having uh, these things, these capacities, however, believers have the potential to become even more like God. Now I'm saying this, uh, this whole thing that I'm showing you, I hope I can get through this, bring it all together. Most people would read Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, talking about man being in the likeness of God, and they would press on. And there are believers that would rather do that than drill down on something that I see as very important, and I had to bring several verses together that would be an inspiration to you. It would also help us to see how phenomenally God is, to how his grace towards people is so phenomenal. And that's what I'm going to show you. So far we know that every person, believer and unbeliever, is in the image of God in the ways that I've stated. But now there is a, a, a superior way, a better way to be in the likeness of God. And that's what I'm going to show you. So turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Verse 22 kind of jumps in the, in the middle of it, but we have to start somewhere. And I want to focus on verse 24, but we start in verse 22. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. That in reference to your former manner of life. Let me stop there for just a second. For some of us, our former manner of life was pretty normal. Uh, we might even say legalistic. We didn't have God in our lives, but we, we weren't uh, serial killers. Uh, we weren't members of uh, the Hells Angels. They don't, nobody even talks about them anymore, do they? I don't even know if they still exist, but I guess they do. Anyway, we had a pretty normal 
um, manner of life. And then there are some of us that were pretty big stinkers. Uh, we were naughty. But I want you to notice that this says, former manner of life of what was in the past. He's speaking to believers here. He said, you, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust and deceits. It doesn't matter what your manner of life in the past was, whether it was good or bad, whether you were into legalism or whether you were into hell raising, whatever it may be, it says, this is a command, lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust and deceit. Thinking all about ourselves and not giving a hoot about God or his word. We are told to lay that aside, verse 23, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Just underline, renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's where the renewal has to take place. It's in the mind, in the news. And the way that it is renewed is by changing what you're thinking that you used to have into a new way of thinking. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And I don't have to tell this. You already know it. That's what's taking place this very moment. You're being renewed in the spirit of your mind. You're, you're, you're learning things you didn't know before, and it's going to change who you are and how you behave. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self. I want you to underline that, star that one. This is a command. We are commanded to put on a new self, something that wasn't there before. Which, look what it says, which is in the likeness of God. You see how this comes about now? In other words, all people are in the likeness of God, both believers and unbelievers. But for believers, they have an opportunity to be in a superior or even a, a, a better image of God. And the way that's done is by what? Putting off the old self and being renewed in the spirit of your mind. This is a command. You put it on. Which is in the likenesses of, of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So you have to be renewed in your mind and then put on. Let me put, let me, I'm going to tell you this in just a moment, but I'm going to say it now. I was going to save it, but every believer is renewed in one sense, positionally. In other words, when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, then you become a new person, a new creation, a new spiritual species. Does anybody know where you find that in the Bible? Well, let's go to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 18. 2 Corinthians 15, 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18. In fact, I'll put this one on the board so you can see it. I want you to see some things in this. Now, we already saw, if you're a believer already, that we are to put off the old self and be renewed in the spirit of our mind and put on, put on the new self. See, what I'm, what I'm trying to show you here is when you believe in Jesus Christ, you positionally, in a sense, you're standing before God is new. That's a new self. But so many believers don't put it on. They don't take hold of it. They remain spiritual babies. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that if, you can put there, is a first-class conditional clause, meaning if and it's true. Since. You could say since instead of if. Since, since you are, if, first-class conditions, and it's true, anyone is in Christ, he is a new 
creature. You become a new creature the moment that you believe the gospel. Over 40 things, permanent things happen to you. You don't feel it. You don't even know it happens. But you become a new spiritual species. You have phenomenal spiritual assets that nobody ever before us or after us in the church age will have. That's automatic for every person who believes the gospel. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Now, I want you to write these in your margin somewhere. Put these here because this is so mistranslated. So many people think, oh, well, I'm a new person. Since I'm a new creature, I'm a new spiritual species, the, it says the old things have passed away. That means I'm gonna, uh, my cursing is gone. I'm not going to curse anymore. Uh, I'm not going to get angry anymore. I'm not going to judge people anymore. Is that reality? This is what God does for us. This is what happens. Not what we do, what God does. We'll see that in verse 10. So the old things that have passed away is, first of all, condemnation. Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And this starts out in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If anyone is in Christ, you are in Christ because of what happened to you the moment that you believed in Jesus Christ. You were what that put you into, the, into in Christ? What puts you in that position? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism here means identified. The moment you believed in Jesus Christ, you were permanently and unalterably identified with Jesus Christ, and you will be for all eternity. And you are now. And these are some of the benefits of being in Christ, which is automatic for a believer who, or a person who believes the gospel. So condemnation is gone. Spiritual death is gone. You were spiritually dead, now you have a human spirit. Now you can have a relationship with God, and the absolute control of your old sin nature is no more. Oh, you still have it, but there's not absolute, absolute control, because you have the Holy Spirit indwelling your body as well. So don't ever come to me and say, well, I know I'm sinning, but I can't help it. Boy, what I like to say what I want to say here. You can't help it. To say that you can't help but sin is alleging that Christ did not break the absolute control of your old sin nature on the cross, which he did. Behold, new things have come. And again, a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm going to be nicer now. I'm going to even uh, uh, go visit my neighbor that I can't stand, all the rest of it. That's nonsense. This is what God did at that moment. The new things that have come is, number one, eternal life. You have eternal life. And you had it since the moment that you believed in Jesus Christ. And these people say, oh, well, yeah, you, can lose, you can lose your salvation. Well, that, then we need to rename eternal life and make it temporary. You, you can, God imputes temporary life to you. That's no big deal because if there's a way to lose it, I would lose it, I can assure you. And you might also. But when it's eternal, it's eternal. So you have eternal life plus R is God's own righteousness. We could never be righteous enough for God to accept us, so he has to give us his own righteousness, which he does. Perfect righteousness. And for somebody to think that they have to work their way into heaven, that means they've rejected God's righteousness and they're depending on their own works, which they will be indicted for at the great white throne. Um, the indwelling, filling, and baptism of the Holy Spirit. These are the things, the new things that have come. And then it says, Behold, these new things have come. Now all these things are of me, you, of God. In other words, God the one that did all of these things who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, which is another way of saying he's given us the, responsible, the responsibility to give the gospel to others. So do you see what's happening now? Whoop, I don't want you to see that right now. Okay, need to go back over here. Here. And here. 
Okay. We have this. Adam was perfect, made in God's image. We have the uh, believers and unbelievers, imperfect. They're still made in God's image. And now we have this. Believers who have the imputation plus R of God. We have EL, which is eternal life. Believers have this. And so they are closer to the image of God. All believers are. Positionally, they're standing before God. You got that? Every person here, I assume that you are all believers. If you're not, you better stick around and hear the, the last part of the service. But all of you have God's own righteousness and eternal life. And all believers, it doesn't matter if they're scoundrels. They have that. And so they are closer to the image of God. And I have a few verses. Romans 4, 5 has to do with the righteousness. To the one who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his what? Faith is credited as righteousness. When you have faith in Jesus Christ, that God credits you his own righteousness. What about eternal life? John chapter 3 verse 36. He who believes on the Son has, at that moment, eternal life. But he who does not believe the wrath of God uh, shall abide upon him. And then we have 2 Corinthians five seventeen through 18, which we just went over, that those who are in Christ are a new spiritual species. They are a new creation. That's positionally. So you see the progression here. Adam was perfect, image of God. All his offsprings are imperfect, have an old sin nature. So they're in Adam's uh, image, but also in God's image in that sense. But now we have believers who are, have God's own righteousness and eternal life. And of course that would make them what? Closer to the image of God. And we have one more step to go here. Here it is. These are positive believers. Po plus vol means positive volition for believers. Positive believers have experiential have been experientially sanctified i know that experientially sanctification it kind of reminds me of when i was at baraka the colonel used to say that uh, you need to be um he talks about post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation now say that to some unbeliever and watch his eyes roll um it's just a fancy way of saying that uh, you need to grow up. But uh, experientially means in our experience in life, we can, as believers, we can get closer even than this one that all believers have, closer to the image of God. But in a positional sense, they all are able to do that. But for us, church-age believers, we can get even closer by taking in the word of God, growing in grace and knowledge, which is we, what we are commanded to do, and we get closer to the image of God, that's the closest as we can get, and at that point, God rewards us as well with rewards. And you see this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. I'd like to leave that on there, but I've got to get back to my notes on the other one. I'll come back to this if you like. I, I made all this to simplify. I hope it is not having the opposite effect. So, our mission as believers is to put on the new self. See, we are already the new self as of the point we believe the gospel. We're not like we used to be because all these things that we looked at in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, that God, the old things passed away, the things new. So we are already a new self. But having a new self, or being a new self, and putting it on are two different things. Because you can have the new self and act just as bad as an unbeliever, sometimes worse maybe. But when you put on the new self, it means you're acting like the royal family that you are. Most royal family members don't act like it. So our mission as believers is to put on the new self that we received at salvation by becoming a new, create, a new creature experientially. You understand that? 
You're a new creature already. Everybody, all believers, because you have eternal life, you have God's own righteousness. You are an ambassador. You have the indwelling, the filling, the baptism, the sealing ministries of the Holy Spirit. You have all these things that are automatic. But to put on the new self is to recognize these things, get out of spiritual kindergarten, and start acting like a mature member of the royal family. When we do this, we get closer to the image of the one who created us. Now I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I'm trying not to go too fast. I'm trying to repeat, but I'm trying to get to a point all at the same time. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Here, I'll put it on the board for you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with, with its evil practices. What does that say there? Lay aside? Didn't we just hear that? Your old habits can be broken, but you, it's just like on New Year's Eve and people make these New Year's resolutions. I'm going to stop eating like I have. I'm going to be thin. And I make a resolution. Heck, you could have it notarized. And how long does it last? We, when it says lay aside the old, si uh, the, uh, lay aside the old self, this is not a one-time deal. This is something you have to do every single day. Is not let that old self creep back in. You have to keep it away. And you become the new self. But in order to be the new self, you have to keep feeding that your, your spirit, you have to keep feeding your soul the nutrients that will keep it away. It's an ongoing thing. And so it says, Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. You've done that and have put on the new self. How do you do that? By learning doctrine is a simple way. I mean, the easiest way to put it. You change your thinking and your thinking is changed by consistently taking in the Word. If you're not consistent, consistent, it will not work. If you have a cavalier, uh, I can take it or leave it, leave it doctrine, you are still your old self. Well, you're the new self but acting like the old self. So lay aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed. Look at that. Present tense. It's in the process of being renewed. If, if we meet again here in 10 years, 20 years, it doesn't matter how many years, we're still going to be in the process. You know what ends the process? You're right. <laughs> when you quit breathing. And have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge. That word there for knowledge is epinosis, full knowledge. That's knowledge that you have acquired, that you have understood, and you accept it and you believe it, and it has changed who you are. That's what doctrine does. It goes into the soul, into the spirit, and it changes your thinking. And you are who you think. So, and have put on the new self who is being renewed, it's a process, to a true knowledge According to what? The image of the one who created him. Do you see the image there again? So do you see this progression went from Adam then to his offsprings, believers and unbelievers, then to believers. They're closer because they have all these imputed things at the moment of salvation. They're closer. But God wants us to be in this last category where we are... Positive believers, we consistently take in the Word of God, and it, may, it helps us keep the old self away, and the new self is there. Now we can be good and faithful servants. So in order to get to this level of the image of the one who created us, then you have to put on the new self. You've got to put off the old self and put on the new self. The way you put on the new self 
is in your past evolution, you are a God seeker. You are consistently seeking God, learning his word, and his word changes how you think, who you are, and you become a new person. That is the new self. Now, once you put on that new self, are you on easy street then? I've got this knocked. I mean, I, I put on the new self. I can coast now. How's that going to work? You see, we have here in verse 10, this is, I want you to underline this, maybe that'll help. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, being a renewed present tense, it keep, it's an ongoing action. An ongoing action doesn't mean you come once a month, you open your Bible once every three months, or when there's a disaster or whatever. I bet people are searching for their Bibles down in Florida. I, mean, I wonder how many people are, when they're taking the things that they want to take with them, I wonder how many of them are including the Bible in what they take. I guarantee you, I would... Now, I'm not boasting. Now, I'll tell you the reason why this isn't a boast. I would take this before I would take... I don't know. I, I, I've got two cats. I, <laughs> I like them sometimes. I was going to say before my pets, but anyway, I would be sure this would be, I would need this. And the reason I need this particular one is because I've been making notes in it for 30 years. And that is irreplaceable. Now, this is not a boast. Actually, I should be ashamed. I shouldn't need the notes, but I do. And so, I hope you get it. Let's look at this one more time. Let's see what I have next here. Oh, good. Look here. This is today's lesson starts right here. Do you see it? <laughs> lesson 36, 9, 10, 17. Silly me. I thought we would get to that too. Uh, let me show you this, and then we'll be done. I want you to get another shot at this. Let's see, I've got to get rid of that, get out of the way. We're going to see this one more time, show the, the whole enchilada. Okay, there's Adam, there's his sons, all, both believers and unbelievers. Here we have believers only, all believers get righteousness and eternal life, close to the image of God, and then this is where we want to be, Positive volition believers with experiential sanctification getting closer to the image of God. That's where we want to be. Now, there are people who have left this church because I teach, I, I'm too slow. I don't cover enough verses. They, I, 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 I'm too deep. Well, that's okay. There's a lot of belief. At least, at least some of these people are honest. When it comes to God's word, I don't want to go too deep. Let's stay superficial. If that's what they want, that's fine. And I don't, that's their deal. My job is to crank it out. But I think this is important. I think it inspired me how this progression takes place. All from the image of God. And if you do a search on the image of God and you see these verses and you start connecting them, it's just like it comes into focus. There it is. That's where we want to be. Is down here in this bottom one, uh, closer to God's image. As church age believers, we can't get closer to God in this body, in this time, than that. And that's where God wants us to be. Now, there will be a time we're going to be closer to Him because we'll see Him. Boy, that, I, sooner the better. But anyway, uh, there it is. I'm going to leave that on the board for you because if you want to write something down, but... The last portion of this service is for unbelievers. Now, I think, I hope everybody here is a believer, but there are people who are live streaming. This goes out on DVDs and CDs and audios and everything, and they might not know for certain uh, what's going to happen to them after they die. So I, I want them to know that I have good news for them. Listen, people all over South Texas, People in Florida and, and in Georgia and Alabama and the Carolinas and all, there are going to be a lot of people that are desperately seeking some good news. 
And we need to look for opportunities to tell them, you know what, I have some good news, but this isn't just good news. This is the best news you'll ever hear. What an opportunity. And you'll probably have their ear like you would never have before. But what is the good news? Well, the good news is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He went to the cross to die for your sins, my sins, the sins of the world. He accomplished that mission. He was buried and he rose from the grave and he offers eternal life to anyone who will trust him and him alone for it. And the moment that you accept the free gift of eternal life by simply believing that Jesus Christ took care of your sin problem on the cross and you're not trying to work your way in any way, in that moment, you become a member of God's royal family. Your ticket to heaven is guaranteed, and now you can get beyond this believers who are just closer to God because they believed the gospel, and I'm not minimizing that. That's big. But what is even bigger is to be closer to God because you have grown in grace and knowledge. You have no fear of death. You have no fear of anything. You are living the abundant life, and that's just a taste of what's ahead. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for who and what you are, and your grace is unlimited. We thank you that we have your word. We thank you that you have enabled us to go from unbelievers to believers to super grace believers, all because of your grace. Nothing do we have to offer other than the desire to seek you, to know you, the positive volition. We pray that those that have been affected by these storms in Houston area, South Texas, as well as Florida, and the other all across the, the land there, that they will not become embittered and angry because they have suffered loss, but that this suffering will cause them to be humble and seek your face, and they will know that from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We lift our prayer in Christ's most high and holy name. Amen.